This morning, as we prepare ourselves for the time of observing the Lord's table, uh, we're going to look briefly into God's word. So if you don't have a Bible, we have some gentlemen who are going to come down the aisles. And if you, if you don't have one with you this morning, please just raise your hand and they'll make sure that you get a copy of it. Uh, if you don't own a Bible, uh, we'd like you to just go ahead and keep it as our gift to you. You know, one of the problems that all of us have as weak and sinful human beings is the inability to finish what we started. So often we start things and for one reason or another, we're unable to complete that task. And our lives are scattered with all these little and sometimes big incomplete tasks and projects. But unlike us, we have a God who is able to finish every task that he starts. And even though at times it may appear like he's not able to finish it, but yet one day he will accomplish everything that he purposed to do. You know, when God extended the gift of salvation to us, as believers, uh, his desire, his goal, his purpose is to make us more like Christ. We looked at this in our study of the book of Romans, Romans 8, 29, for those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So from the moment of our salvation, God begins a task of molding, shaping our lives into the character of his son. And it's God's will, God will complete the task that he started. The Apostle Paul reminded the believers in Philippi, in Philippians 1.6, he who began a good work in you will complete it, will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. But exactly how does God make us more like his son? How does that process work? Do we just sit back and let God do all the work? What is our part in that? Well, there's a passage in Paul's letter to the Philippians that explains that. It's found in Philippians chapter 2. So turn with you in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. In chapter 2, Paul begins the chapter by exhorting the believers to be united together by faith by having the attitude of Christ. It's that attitude of considering others as being more important than ourselves that was demonstrated by Christ in his incarnation and his death on the cross. Now, when we come to verse 12, Paul draws what he said in the previous verses to a conclusion. He says, so then, my beloved, in other words, in light of the attitude that Christ has demonstrated his life, just as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence only, but, also, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. The exhortation here is to work out our salvation. Now, what does Paul mean by work out? Our salvation. Now, initially, it sounds like he's saying, work for your salvation. But yet, that's not what Paul is saying. And we know this because Paul is writing to those who are already saved. They're believers. He refers to them in chapter 1 as being saints, as participating in the gospel. We also know this because the rest of Scripture clearly teaches that salvation is a gift of God's sovereign grace apart from any human effort or work. We also know that that's not what Paul is saying because the word work out doesn't mean to work for. It means to work to full completion, to work to the finish, to carry something to its final goal. It means to bring something to its fulfillment to its final conclusion. 
In other words, Paul is exhorting these believers to bring their, the salvation that God gave to them to its ultimate conclusion. What is that ultimate conclusion? What is the end result of our salvation? And that is to be like Christ. To be like him in every aspect of our life. So to work out our salvation is essentially an exhortation to us as believers to strive to be like our Savior. To do everything we can to be like him. To make every effort to reflect Christ in our lives. Now, if we look carefully at the word work out in the original New Testament language, we learn two things. Number one, we learn that striving to be like Christ requires a conscious effort. The word work out is an imperative, it's a command. So it demands obedience on our part. It's a decision of our will. We have the responsibility and the accountability before God to pursue Christ-likeness. Workout is also in the present tense. We could probably better translate it. Keep on working out your salvation. In other words, it requires a continual, sustained effort throughout our entire life until we get to heaven. We also learn from this, not only is it a conscious effort, but striving to be like Christ is a corporate effort. The text says, work out your salvation. And the word, the pronoun your is not singular, it's plural. So Paul is saying here, striving to become like Christ is not just a personal individual effort. It is also a mutual collective effort of believers within the church body. In other words, we are to work together to become like Christ. We're to help each other to grow towards spiritual maturity. Now note the attitude that we're to have as we are working out our salvation, as we're striving to be like Christ. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. We are to strive to be like Christ with a reverential respect before God. See, working out our salvation is not something that we should take lightly. It is a serious, weighty responsibility we have before God. And note the reason why we're to have fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. See, we're personally, we are to personally and corporately strive to be like Christ with a reverential fear because we recognize that in reality, it's the sovereign work of God producing Christ's character in our life. You see, we cannot produce spiritual fruit on our own. Becoming like Christ we can't become like Christ on our own. Apart from him, we can do nothing. The only way we can develop his character in our life is if he does it in us, if he does his work in us. It is his work of sanctification. God is continually, day by day, molding and shaping our lives into the image of his son. Well, our time of communion is a time in which, uh, for those of us who are believers, to remember the work that Christ did on the cross to pay for our salvation. He took the penalty that we deserve so that we could have forgiveness of our sins. The elements in the, of the communion are a symbol that remind us of what he did on the cross. And each time we eat of those elements, it is, it is to affirm in our heart that we're saved only because of what Christ has done. It says in 1 Corinthians 11, for as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 
And as we continue to remember him, we're to do it until he returns. If you really think about it, communion is a part of the sanctification work of God in our life. It's designed by God to remind us to keep our eyes on him, to walk in obedience to him, to abide in him, to be like him, and to look forward to his return. If you're here this morning and you're a believer, then we invite you to join us in our time of remembering Christ. Make sure that you examine your own heart before God, before participating in the communion, to make sure you're doing it in a manner that glorifies Christ. If you're here this morning and you haven't believed in Christ, we're glad that you're here. But I want to share with you that this time of remembrance is something that Christ asks only of us, those of us who have believed in him to do. So as the elements are distributed, I would encourage you to let the trade go by you and to use the time to consider Christ's offer of salvation to everyone who believes in him. If you have any questions, I would encourage you to talk to one of the pastors, one of the elders of the church, or perhaps the person that invited you. And they'll be glad to answer any questions that you might have. After you receive the elements, uh, please take them on your own when you're ready. Gentlemen, please come and service the elements.